If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell icon to get the latest updates. Hey guys. Hello. Hey. One, two, three, four. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Loud and okay. Perfect. How about now? And can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, let me just do a quick check of uh, who we got online. We got Akash, Mohan, and Shuri. Thank you guys for attending. I bet you in the next minute, someone else will join as well. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and start. I think um, today I'm just gonna do a brief, like overall functionality of recruiting module. Recruiting module itself is huge. Uh, it's basically a system by itself. So there's no way we could cover everything about it within the you know, seven or eight hours that we have in it. So I'm going to try to focus on the key areas. Um, I mean, there is whole applications that are you know, designed for applicant tracking system and Workday's recruiting module is more than just a ATS or applicant tracking system. It's, there's a planning portion in it. Uh, there's sourcing and then there's contact management and then there's onboarding. So I'm just copying this graphic from Workday community. So it's got all of these things and it's basically a whole, you know, application just like, you know, HCM as an application for employee management. Recruiting is, the um, work to recruiting is an application for everything from um, prospect profiles to sourcing and then planning via requisitions and then onboarding. So um, no one will believe, believe you if you say, hey, I did recruiting module and I took care of the security and I took care of the integrations as a single person because it's just, um, rec recruiting is just so intensive in terms of like how much work there is. So it's usually, um, you know, while in comparison, like for example, for benefit administration, it gets busy only during, you know, just before the open enrollment setups. And so someone could do it part-time, right? Like you're gonna take care of the HCM system or you might be taking care of a couple of different things. And then when it's time for open enrollment, you work on those tasks at, along with, you know, taking care of the HCM system and any other like work issues. But I think from my experience and talking to other people also in recruiting, you really need someone who's dedicated to this module to support it. You, you cannot have someone like supporting HCM and supporting like security and then at the same time doing um, recruiting module. It, re it really needs a dedicated person. So no one person is not gonna be expected to have all of the knowledge that's required to support recruiting. It, it's just really huge module and we'll touch on some of the, the key points on it. Hey Ramesh, when we say um, sourcing and candidate relationship management, I'm assuming uh, sourcing is the whole applicant uh, process, or applicant process uh, all the way through um, 
offer and probably even onboarding or sorry number no not onboarding but all the way through offer process right you're saying sourcing like what does sourcing entail yeah sourcing does it entail um just the applicant process all the way through offer and uh, where does the job requisitions and or the job postings come into the picture in this, in so this. when we talk about planning, right? Okay. Um, so hiring manager and the recruiter and the finance budgetary team, they will get together and they will plan what requisitions they need, you know, for the coming quarter or for the coming year. Okay. And right. And that would be part of the workforce planning. And based on that conversation, the recruiter or the hiring manager, they will create a requisition. So right. requisition means a request. Right. And we're, we're talking about job requisitions. Mm -hmm. So a request for a job. So that will go through an approval. Right. Uh, the request is, um, the request is linked to one or more positions and then it will go through an approval process. Mm -hmm. And once it's approved, then the recruiting team uh, or the talent acquisition team, then they will start sourcing the candidates. Um, okay, got it. So does the system, I mean, I know I'm forward questioning, but once the job posting has been approved, does it automatically create um, the sorry for the job requisition once it's approved does it automatically create the job posting or how is it in this system um, uh, yeah so it, you have to select uh, how you want to post it right right so, so there will be uh you have you could post it internally uh, uh, and you could post it externally you could default in certain places where you could post it is that automated in Workday or does someone needs to repost it or use a button the, like the recruiter needs to use a button to post it out to the... Uh, you do need to select uh, where to post it. Okay, got it. That was the question. Uh, you could have you know, certain integrations that will take the data from behind the scenes and push it out to um, like, a, a, like a posting integrator. So mm -hmm. it, it could happen automatically if you, know, if you have a behind the scenes integration. Right. Got it. Okay. So that's, the, um, that's the role of sourcing is to, once it's posted, uh, then the talent acquisition team, they will go ahead and search for candidates who apply to that, or they could go, um, um, they could look for candidates internal or external. Mm -hmm who may not be linked to the requisition at all. They might just free source them. Right. And then um, they'll mark them as prospects. Right. Yeah. And then when someone is marked as a prospect, then recruiting also has what's called a candidate relationship management, or CRM. Um, this is basically handling the communication uh, that needs to happen between the recruiting team and the candidate and also with the hiring manager right okay that part okay. of managing and communicating with uh, candidate is the candidate relationship management all the way through offer. right and, and then, where does onboarding start when uh, when you're categorizing or classifying this yeah. as onboarding where right. does the onboarding is it after the offer acceptance right. it will be offer so onboarding only starts after the offer is accepted where so, does it end in recruitment? Um, onboarding, uh, where does it end? That. What I'm asking is onboarding, uh, when you hear it's even in HCM, right? So where does recruiting part of onboarding end? Or what does it encompass really? Yeah, so onboarding, it kind of is it, it's, it's part of HCM, or you could say it's part of recruiting. I will cover this because it's, um, it's a critical piece. What, what, what it means by onboarding is once the offer is accepted, then the candidate 
is now a pre-hire, right? right? So as part of pre-hire, they're ready to onboard and they're ready to come into the HCM part and they need to enter their, for example, in the United States, they will need to enter their onboarding information, which means background check. Um, they will enter their I-9 information, their legally, you know, whatever legal paperwork they need to submit. That step is within onboarding. So I-9 verification happens within onboarding. The um, so basically, after the it's all about post offer act acceptance and um, pre hire status. The whole pre whatever happens, events happen during the pre hire right. status. It's called onboarding and recruitment. Got right. It. And even um, any setups, for example, IT needs to know if this person prefers a uh, Mac laptop or IBM compatible. Those mm -hmm. kind of questions will be set up in the onboarding step. Right, facilities uh, uh, onboarding, part of onboarding, got it. Correct. So this is, onboarding is a business process. Okay. Um, and then you basically have the hire step combined with the onboarding step. And once you kick off the hire step, then the onboarding step kicks off and it sends an email to the, uh, to the candidate with their login information if they're not using recruiting, if they're using recruiting, then it will be the same information that they used as a candidate, as a, uh, when they were a prospect. So, uh, but onboarding is, you, you cannot do recruiting without onboarding, but you right. could do onboarding without recruiting. Right, true. <coughs> okay. okay. Um, uh, hey, one follow-up question. I know now you will touch it later. Overall, for recruitment, what are all the integration touch points? Like benefits, you know definitely that at the end, it's sent out to third parties. But in recruitment, you already mentioned one where the job posting is sent out to third parties. And that's one integration point already. What are the general integration points in recruiting non-integration points? Uh, so bringing the data in of candidates, like for example, uh, from LinkedIn or from Google Hire, like Google has a uh, app mm -hmm. where like some companies, they won't use uh, the screening questions within Workday, they will use Google Hire's application. So you have, a, you have some type of an API call with Google Hire, so you're your requisition data goes to Google Hire and then from Google Hire back to Workday. So they may have some screening questions. Okay. And candidate evaluation might happen within the Google Hire app instead of the Workday app. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So it really depends how the companies have, have uh, set it up. How you set it up. Okay. Yeah. That's why I said it's, it's, this is a like a really a full-time job. You really can't support another module and recruiting at yeah. the same time. I mean, that's the big uh, Pandora box opening up over there itself with all these external uh, kind of job aggregators. Yep. Applicants post it directly and it will be all the information is captured directly on their sites and sent back. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Ramesh, a question, Ashok here. So is the background check agency linked anywhere after the offer is rolled out before the uh, yes. the hire happens? Is it integrated and how, how does the workflow work? Okay. So background check is part of the um, is part of the activity stream and you could uh, link it out to, you know, whichever background check uh, company that you use. And it is a step within the um, onboarding within process. the on onboarding process. So we'll we'll see that as a step also, so that it, it happens seamlessly within the system. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I just copied this screenshot from uh, the community. This is like a, this is a dashboard for recruiting. 
like if a recruiter or a hiring manager is looking at it. So if you're on the recruiting worklet, you'll see your, your candidates and total candidates, the number of candidates who are in review stage, the number that are in screening, uh, the number that are in the offer stage, and then you know the number who have gone through the background check, and then the one candidate that will be in the higher stage. This is for a manager, right, or recruiter? Uh, this could be for both. Okay. Yeah. So they'll be sh sharing the uh, candidate pipeline. Okay. Uh I have a question. Um, the CRM is that basically what they what they use to to f like filter a resumes. Uh, this is no. So the CRM is it's just contact management between the candidate and uh, the hiring team. So this is not the tool that actually does the parsing. Um, the parsing will happen. I mean. Uh, in a prior step, so but so yeah, the CRM portion is not the not the part that does the actual parsing, but the parsing happens and then the data gets populated in the um, you know in, in the candidate and the and the candidate profile is created. I think that. this question um, uh, the communication between the recruiter. Um, and the applicants that they deem um, as possible candidates and uh, uh, all that communication and uh, selecting them and moving them into interview status and all that, that's part of candidate relationship management. Correct. Yeah. The way in, the recruiters interact with all the, with the applicants, that's part of the candidate relationship management, CRM. Yeah. So we'll just do a kind of like a functional overview. There's the candidate pipeline and there's touch points with, um, you know, with LinkedIn profile or posting it on other social media and there's sourcing, uh, referral and candidate management. So internal employees, uh, if you have worked a implemented, the internal employees could also refer other candidates to jobs and that's internal management. They could also apply to jobs themselves. And now um, Workday also has interview uh, scheduling and collaboration. You could schedule um, interviews. I believe it's available with Google calendars and Outlook calendar. But you could initiate that scheduling from within uh, Workday. And then there is the offer templates. And then once the offer template is offer is signed and approved, and then you go through the onboarding. So this is basically the key areas of work day recruiting. Um, so just for awareness purposes, what it you know everything that it takes to cover it fully. There is a security and tenant setup that needs to happen for work to recruiting. Um, and then when you, when the recruiter posts a job, they could also create questions or questionnaire so that candidate fills out a uh, response to these questions. Uh, that's called questions and questionnaires. And then there's, you tie the question to the job requisition and there's also evergreen requisitions. So we'll get, we'll get into what that definition is in a little bit. Uh, then there's job posting and career sites. And then there is the recruiting sub processes. Uh, we'll get into that. And then the big one uh, is the job application business process. So I want to make sure that I cover you know, how to configure that business process. Um, and then there's the prospects and candidates. Um, and then the candidate view of their data, the recruiter view, 
which we call the experience. And then there's recruiting reports. Uh, and then there is a referral, uh, like an internal referral functionality is there. Uh, and then scheduling and Microsoft Outlook integration. For this part, I'm just gonna just make you guys aware that there is such a thing, uh, but we're not gonna work on the integration, but I'll show you guys where that setup is. Uh, then we'll look at offer letter. Um, and then there's some security configurations. There is a confidential candidate and confidential job requisitions, which are jobs that you post, but you don't want anybody to be aware of them. So you have a hidden URL. So you create a requisition, but it doesn't show up anywhere, but you have the URL and then you can send it directly to the candidate that you want. So those are called confidential candidates or confidential job recs. There's also the functionality of recruiting agencies that can be set up and they will have access to the Workday recruiting portal for your company. And then there's reporting and analytics. So there's, uh, there's so, a lot of stuff in here. I'll, I'll try to touch upon the main so points. I mean, for recruiting agencies, uh, when you say access, do they have access to, will they have access to the internal site or what is that? What does it mean? Uh, they will have access to uh, submit candidates to, you know, from the, uh, the external site. Okay. Okay. All right. These are apart from the, the, uh, the social systems, the social websites. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Oh, they can pretty much uh, submit it as if the recruiters are submitting directly by themselves. Right. So oh. recruiting agency is also set up as a, uh, as an, uh, workday account. Okay. And then using that functionality, the recruiters of those agencies could submit, uh, candidates. Well, it's like another source. Yeah. <laughs> so, Delivered role by workday or? Uh, I'm sorry, say again. Do they have a specific role that workday created for them, recruiting agencies? Because their role seems to be similar as uh, a recruiters, right? So, do they have any sub special? Uh, right. They do have special roles for them. Okay. It looks like Sunday wants it, has a question. So yes, yeah, security and tenant setup and security configuration, those are two different topics. Um, the security and tenant setup? Yes, and security configuration. Correct, yeah, those are two, there are two separate topics, yeah. Okay. So there are some things that you need to turn on or you know, some decisions that you uh, have to make or you know, sometimes a company may have a particular decision, then they need to change that decision. So that's part of the uh, tenant setup. Um, the functional area security, I guess, right? The whole recruiting security. Correct. Global level. Yeah. Okay. So let me just go through some more uh, notes on it, a little bit more of the functionality before we actually go into the system. Um, you know, just a graphic that shows that all of the candidate data goes into this, you know, funnel. And then you have a very large number of candidates and then they funnel down through each of the recruiting steps. And then they go through the onboarding and then they become part of the HCM portion. And then somebody from the HCM portion could also apply for an internal job. And then they go through this uh, funnel again. Okay. Just a demonstration of that. Um, and then let me just go through some of the definitions. So we spoke of the word onboarding. So what is onboarding? Onboarding is a setup and management, a process that guides workers through onboarding tasks, such as updating their contact information, personal information, and submitting uh, electronic I-9 in the, in the United States. 
and then it also allows you to communicate any uh, information to them and collect any information from them as well as collect the electronic signature and acknowledgement of that they have received certain documents. Uh, you might have the candidates um, electronically sign and agree to, for example, the non-disclosure document or every company has like a list of documents that they want to make sure that every new hire, they acknowledge that they have received the handbook. Uh, so as part of onboarding, they could uh, acknowledge that they have received it and then they will electronically sign it. So the background uh, is not part of this? It's not initiated here? No, the, the background check is uh, happens actually before you do onboarding. Like you okay. can do onboarding. Uh, right. Well, technically you can, but you're not supposed to do onboarding until you pass the on or uh, mm -hmm. until you pass the background check. Got so it. The background check is not uh, part of on onboarding. It should be part of the candidate candidate workflow. So on this one, would you show us how to like integrate the I nine into Workday? Uh, yeah. So onboarding step. Uh, this is a business process that has the I nine already built in. So once, I mean, as an implementer, you do need to set that up uh, at the implementation time, but I'll, I'll show you an existing uh, setup where uh, I9 step is configured and I'll show you how, uh, how and where the I9 step is. Uh, that would be nice though, especially like the implementation of I9. Uh, um, I didn't catch the first part of that last sentence. Said that, that would definitely be nice, especially the impl Im implementation, like, you know, like the setup. I'll make a note of that. Thank you. <coughs> Amish, I have one question. Yes. Uh, somewhere I heard of dynamic business process. Yes. So are you going to cover that? Yeah. So that's, uh, that's one of the key things I think I'll spend a lot of time on. Okay. And because it is very different than HCM business process. So we'll cover the, uh, the dynamic business process. Um, okay. So let me just show you guys the different roles and proxy as a recruiter in one of the orgs in our um, training tenant. Can you guys see the remote desktop now? Yes. 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 So I'm just going to go into a um, sales or sales supervisory organization. So I I, I'm going to click on sales supervisory org. And just so that we know where to go to see the roles. So if we click on the roles tab, we see that there is a role for hiring manager. So let me scroll down. There is a role for HR partner. And then there is a recruiter role. Okay. So these are the four, you know, uh, 
some of the roles that are part of the recruitment, there's going to be an HR partners typically involved, the managers involved, and there is the recruiting, uh, recruiting team or a recruiter who's involved. So these are the different roles that will be involved that will proxy in as. And here as Logan, I'm gonna go to the uh, recruiting worklet. So we're right now we're, we're looking at things as a manager. So I'm gonna go to the, well, I'll, I'll go to the, um, the homepage and then from there we'll click on the recruiting worklet. So this is the actionable recruiting worklet. Uh, the manager has access to the find candidates reports. So obviously this is a link. You could also type in find candidates here. Um, there's also reminders within Workday. Uh, they could also initiate creating the job requisition. They could do evergreen requisition. Uh, they could also invite internal or external candidates to apply to a particular requisition the manager may have. Uh, they could create a prospect. Prospect means like they could create a contact and then the recruiting team will contact them. And then if they do want to be a candidate, then uh, the person, it will no longer be a prospect, it will be a candidate. And then they could view recruiting agency uh, they could also view their requisitions. Uh, they could view them by recruiter, um, a bunch of other functionality, any referrals. So this is basically their working uh, workbench. So that my open job requisitions, is that, um, this is the manager view, right? Yeah, this is manager view. So um, my open job requisitions dash recruiter, what does it mean? So this is just a report and this report might be by sorted recruiter. by recruiter. Okay, yeah. This might be sorted by manager. It, it's, this is just a report. Uh, just the sort might be different. So is a recruiter automatically assigned to an organization or how is it done in this for all the job recruiters? Uh, so a recruiter role is assigned to an organization. So when if there's a new recruiter, he or she would be assigned to handle like certain organizations. Okay. So there, uh, these are the requisitions. So Workday automatically shows the most recent ones. And uh, this little thing right here is a chatbot. This is new functionality. Um, this really doesn't, it's not particular to recruiting, but I just happened to see this. Uh, so this chat functionality is like, um, it's like instant messenger. You could talk to Workday, a manager could use this and request, um, uh, you could ask to transfer an employee. Um, and you could talk in natural language, you know, can you transfer my employee? And, but the, this Workday Assistant is gonna be rolled out to all the, um, all the Workday customers in about a week time. Right now it's only available to those who have signed up for early adoption, but I thought it was something pretty neat. You could request time off from here. So it seems like in this instance, it's only enabled for request time off and view pay information, but not for transferring employees. Uh, I thought it was uh, it's a pretty neat functionality. I'm going to be implementing this um, and I'll wet up the steps that need to happen. You need to set up the security for it. And you also get to select what task you could do, but this is a new, uh, new functionality called chatbot. So it's pretty cool. Just a side note. Um, okay. 
So back to recruiting. Uh, so this is the recruiting worklet. And now let me go to a particular requisition. So requisitions or positions, there will be, you, you go to the supervisory organization, like anyone, and then you go to the staffing tab. This is where the, uh, the positions or the requisitions would be. So in this case, it starts with P. So it doesn't have a requisition. This is still a position. But position is, um, you know, is part of the requisition. So requisition has not been created. So a requisition pulls information from the position, right? From the position data. Correct. Correct. But if I go to the, um, um, I could go back to the worklet and get another. Uh, requisition. So a position can be created without a requisition. So if we uh, go ahead. So so uh, a position can can be created without a requisition. So what's the need of a requisition? Then? Uh, so yes, it can be created without it, but if you're using uh, recruiting, um, it's an option if you want to make it a requirement or not. And the need is basically, uh, so you could send it as a request for approval. So you could send it as a request for approval to the budgetary team or to um, uh, any other team that needs to approve it and it's for planning purposes. So before something could become a position, it needs to be approved to be a position. So a company may do approval outside of the system, and then they'll, in that case, they'll just create a position. So even, if, even though a position is already filled and active, so a worker is active in it, you can still create a position out of it. Correct, yes. And then I'll go into the setup where that, um, where that is. Let me log in as the, uh, let me log in as the um, recruiter so I could see the candidates. So it's James Moore. Open job requisitions and right. Okay, so here's a requisition. It doesn't have any uh, active candidates on it, but one of the key things that 
uh, you need to use requisition for. There was a question like, why do we use position? You know, what's the need of a requisition and not just a, a position? Is like this field uh, target hired it is not available on the position, and sometimes you need this for planning purposes. Uh, so this is one uh, thing that's that's not there on the on the position, the target hire date. Uh, recruiting start date is also not there, but there is, um, you know, there is the target start date. Like you cannot hire someone before that on the position, but there is no target hire date. Um, but the overview has the details. Uh, you mean um, before the target hire date, they cannot be hired into the system? Uh, there is a target hire date, but then there is also the uh, start date. So oh. the start date is on the position, so you cannot hire them before the start date. Okay, got it. But for planning purposes, when you create a requisition, uh, you need to have a target hire date. So finance will know that hey, this requisition is created for third quarter or fourth quarter, so they know which quarter to budget the cost for that requisition. But this doesn't stop from um, the someone being hired into that position or job posting. Right. Right. Yeah, this field will not stop them, but the, the other field, which is like the start date field will uh, stop them. Okay. Um, so there's some details about the requisition. Uh, is name, this format, uh, which org it is in, uh, which position is associated with, and in a bunch of other fields, if there was a uh, questionnaire associated with it, it's also under the details tab. Uh, if it was a replacement, then it shows up here. On a position, uh, the replacement field is not there. So those companies that don't, requ that don't use requisition, they have, a, they have a challenge in storing where to keep the replacement name. So in that case, you create a custom field on the position, which could be populated to have the replacement name, but it's not directly on the same screen, right? So it's, it's a custom field and work is in a separate area and then you don't see it all on one, one screen. Okay, so it's got all this information. So you're saying there is no field called replacement for in the requisition page? No, in the position. In the position page, yeah, yeah, right, right. So if, if the company is not using requisition, then they don't have this field by default, the requisition, uh, the replacement for. Okay. Yeah, Got this one's not there by default. But I was giving you a, a workaround. In that case, you could create replacement for as a custom field mm -hmm. on the position. So mm -hmm. you will have it, but it just won't be on the UI. It will be under the additional data. Okay. We should fill that with either the current employee in that position or the most recent instance. Correct. <laughs> There is the compensation tab, which you could, when you're creating the requisition, you could send uh, the requisition step to either the hiring manager or to finance, and they will populate what is the you know total base pay for that requisition. So they will see a base range, and then based on that range, they will also enter um, what would be the appropriate uh, base pay for the hire. And you could route this step to, you know, basically any team that manages the compensation. So it could be a compensation member, it could be a finance, it could be the hiring manager. And then if there was a interview team set up, um, that is available to set up the, the interview team for each requisition. And then there's also 
uh, which call center is under uh, any qualifications, like maybe a list of skills that are necessary. So here they have selected four competencies. Um, and then, you know, where would be posted. So this is not, you know, doesn't seem to be posted anywhere. Uh, but that information would be on the job postings tab. Let me try to pull a uh, some candidates. So here's a requisition that has uh, a lot of candidates. So see if we see here that uh, there are different steps. So this is the dynamic business process that uh, someone brought up earlier. So the order of this, you know, the review, the screening, the assessment, the interview, reference check, uh, employment agreement, the offer, the background check, and then the ready for hire. These steps are configured in the dynamic business process. And the order is, um, is also configured for, for the tenant. And we'll see where that is done. So ideally, when applic applicants apply for this posting, wherever they are, it will show under all active candidates, right? Correct. So there's a lot of stuff over here. So I'm just gonna go slowly so we can see how things look on the, on the functionality side. Right. And then when you scroll down, you could actually see some more detail about the candidates, um, what step they're in. Um, there's the, their resume and their current title and the source. And if they had any answers to the questionnaires. It also automatically calculate the system automatically calculates their years of experience. And so you have that here. So you could sort it by you know total years of experience or years in current job or by current company or by degrees. And then you have the contact tab. And then you could select certain candidates from here, one or multiple, and then you could either move them forward, uh, you could decline them, or you could send them a message, um, or there's a couple other things, you could add them to a particular pool, or you could send them an invitation, uh, and then there's couple, you could also copy them to another requisition. So if I were to move them forward, uh, no candidate available for this action. Can I, how, um, so 
So once it's select and uh, hit on move forward, it will move to the next step, right? Or do we need to specify right. what step? Select, uh, so it doesn't have to be just the next step. You could skip the any particular step. Oh, to any step. If we don't select anything, or do we need to select every time? Uh, you have to select which step you want to move them to. Okay. So it says move selected candidate to next step. And what are the steps actually? What are the all steps? Review, screen, uh, assessment, and interview. We'll, we'll see them on the uh, on one of the uh, you know when we get get there. Can we change these statuses? Uh, some of the labels we can, but not all of the labels. Okay. So, so this is what makes it dynamic, right? Like on the HCM side, you cannot skip steps. But right. here, you could move. You could move them to any stage. I could move them to reference check. I can move them. I can skip oh. all of these, and I can move them <laughs> to ready for hire. So that's what they are calling dynamic business process. Yeah. Is there a separate uh, process for fast tracking or this is what they are calling fast tracking? Um, and sir, can you repeat that? Is there a separate process um, for fast tracking candidates or uh, is this what they call fast tracking? Uh, yeah, so this would be, um, you know, you're fast tracking, you're, you're, you're allowed to skip those steps and go directly to... No, I know, but is there a separate button or a page for doing that or this is what they use? Uh, I mean, unless someone is calling me by a different, you know, different vocabulary, that's what that's oh, what Okay, that is. this is what it is. Okay. And pretty much all the candidate management is done on this page, right? right. On the job requisition page. In, okay. Well, this page is only specific to, you know, this requisition. So all of the candidates with this requisition is here. Okay. Yes. So even the interview feedback, um, they would be here, candidate so, assessments. So for each job requisition, you can define these steps is what we're saying? Correct. Well, you're not going to define them, but you could dynamically select them. You define the steps one time. Okay. Like what was the default order is going to be. Okay. And when you're here, you could actually skip some steps. Okay. So is there a template or something used for the job posting um, or job requisition, whatever? Uh, yes, there is. Um, well, there's, it, it really depends on the configuration, but we'll, we'll get there. Okay, when we get there, we'll see, but yeah, I got an idea. Okay. So now I think, So we saw how you know the hiring manager could view candidates, and they could also decline. Uh, they, they, they could move them forward. Uh, we saw some recruiting terminology, like you know, candidate relationship module, and so next we'll. Uh, I think that's a good time for a break, and then when we come back, we'll talk about some of the setups. We did not see the decline part, right? Can they decline or did we see that? Uh, that's what it is. Uh, I could show you guys, but it was basically, you know, instead of moving forward, okay. uh, decline them. Oh, you have an option to decline them there itself. Got it. Yeah. There was a, you know, where we saw the move forward, there was yes. a button yes. next to it that said decline. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, so uh, let's do a quick 10 minute break and we'll come back and then we'll talk about some of the tenant level uh, decisions that need to be made for uh, recruiting implementation. In your
Ayun. some decisions that the company makes and then we set up the system accordingly let me make sure I'm sharing my screen I think I am you guys still see the um, the server right can you guys hear me Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay. So one decision, for example, a company might need to do is, do they want to enable what's called an activity stream? Um, activity stream is like um, you have a particular candidate and then you want to make some notes about that candidate and then you want to share those notes with the hiring manager. Just like on Facebook, there's the activity stream of everything that you do on Facebook. There's also an activity stream, um, you know, for each candidate or prospect. So to show you an example of that, I pulled up the report called find candidates. And then, you know, this is a delivered report and then you can candidates. So here's the prospects profile. And if we go to the overview, at the bottom is uh, activity stream. So anything that you could top here, um, if you want to tag someone's name so that they get alerted, you put an add symbol and then you could tag them. So add Logan. A check out this 
and it and then that person could respond back and then you could basically have a discussion about this candidate or prospect so this is called an activity stream and some companies may have this some companies may not but this is one of the things that you need to set up uh, in the tenant so let me log in as uh, not as a recruiter but someone who's got more access than the recruiter Logan. In order to actually first, you know, the first thing that you need to, to enable recruiting, you actually have to turn that functional area on. So you go to maintain functional task or maintain functional areas. And this will give you a list of all the workday areas. And there's an enabled column. So uh, you would find a recruiting and, and then enable it first. So in this tenant, everything that's checked, these are stuff that's already been enabled in here. So, you know, there's HCM advanced comp, um, financials, benefits is enabled. Oh, obviously we could filter on it, but I'm just showing you guys everything that's enabled. So here's onboarding. It's, uh, it's kind of like a little separate thing because you could have onboarding without recruiting. And then here's recruiting and recruiting has been enabled. So that's uh, task number one. Then there's a couple other items that are under the edit tenant setup. You guys noticed something? There's there's a there's one search functionality in Workday that's lacking. So when you type in the first few letters or words, you think this is the full list, but that is not true. It's only the first three, six, seven, what is it? Three, four, five, six, seven. It's only the first seven things that pop up. But if you don't know any better, you think, oh, this is all there is. But there's more. And unfortunately, this is this has been like a known issue for a long time and it's still not fixed. Does it at least go by the most recent used by the user ID or it doesn't care? I think it now with the uh, with the new release, it does look at things that you have done most recently and then it will show those. Uh, 
like I was looking for edit tenant system and it is not there. Yeah, the list would be would vary unless you hit it and the whole list pops up fully displayed. And even if you look for someone's name and if it's like a very common name, it would only show you the first eight people or the first seven people. And you wouldn't know that there's another person there. Okay, so this has all of the tenant uh, system related decisions. Um, you know, like the welcome message, any notes. So we're going to scroll down to, uh, this is where the logo is maintained. But for our purposes, we need to go down to activity streams. And we could search, you know, we could do a control F, but I'll just scroll down. Just so that we see everything else that's here. I miss the activity stream. Oh, there it is. Okay. So here, activity stream settings, selected objects for activity stream. So things that are selected here, these profiles will have that activity stream enabled. So remember on that report, I selected prospect. And the reason prospect had the activity stream was because here, uh, prospect was selected. So if I do, if I X out the prospect, then the prospect will no longer have uh, the activity stream. So I won't save that because obviously this is. I'm, I'm, I'm still confused. Um, activity streams, um, these are specific list of tasks. What are those? Uh, no, so activity stream is, um, it allows you to have a discussion or post some notes that you could share it with other team members. Oh yeah, the activity, right, right. Activity where you can collaborate. Um, got right, it. it's like more like a collaboration. So for all of these uh, added in this list, um, there would be an activity um, uh, where you can share information about that particular. Like for example, we see goal. So underneath that goal, there will be an activity stream. Right. And then you can write notes that you could share with your manager regarding that goal. Okay, okay, got it. Nice, nice. And so that's the activity stream. <clears throat> and that was under edit. What are those, what are those called um, uh, prospects and goals? Are those object items? What? Can we add anything in there and it would automatically put in the activity in there or is there a risk? Yes, you could, you know, whatever Workday has enabled for you to select. Okay. Uh, oh, you could select got, in there. Got it, okay, there's a list. Yeah, like for example, I think I saw something related to accounts payable POs. Okay. So then even the purchase orders will have the activity stream. Wonderful, wonderful, got it, thank you. And then now we're gonna go to edit tenant HCM. Here is the um, sequence that we're gonna generate, we're gonna use for uh, the ID of the candidate and the ID of the pre-hire and the employee ID. So these are basically the basic uh, sequence generators. Here we just say, do it sequentially starting from, you know, whatever particular number that's been defined. And sequence ID for new positions. And 
for, you know, for HCM type, there is some defaults like change job default headcount option, like during the job change process, there's multiple options and which one do you want to default? So, you know, I plan to back, backfill this headcount is the defaulted one. And the one that we're interested in is this one. Uh, allow override of restrictions on staffing events. So that means if you create a position or a requisition on that position, and this for San Francisco, but now you find someone in, you know, in a remote location in like say for example, in remote Ohio, if you don't have this selected, uh, then you cannot uh, hire them in Chicago if your requisition is in San Francisco. So in order to have that kind of flexibility, you must have this selected, allow override of restrictions on staffing events. Okay. I did not get that. What, what was it for again? Um, staffing you. So, when you create a position or you create a requisition, mm -hmm. uh, there are some restrictions on it by default. Like you select which location that requisition is going to be in. For example, right. it might be San Francisco. Okay, right. So that right. means the position has been approved for San Francisco and you cannot hire someone in Chicago against that requisition. But if you want to have that flexibility, then you must have this selected as a as a, you must have this checked. So then this allows the override of the restrictions on the staffing events. Uh, did you say we can't hire someone who is located in Chicago or for Chicago location? If you want to override the restrictions on the position. So mm -hmm. the position was in San Francisco, but we're, now we're going to hire them in uh, Chicago. Okay. So in order okay. to do that, this must be checked. Okay. So that's one decision point and the company may have already made this decision, but they want to change this decision. Now, like they're getting really tight, you know, they don't want to give hiring managers the flexibility is they have to hire wherever it's approved. So you would uncheck this. Okay. And there's one more part over here. I need to go to the job requisition section, which is down below. Okay, okay so here under job recs, um, it says enable job requisitions for position management. And there's two, well, there's three choices. It says require job requisitions for all position management staffing events, so that means Whenever you create a position, uh, you have to create a job requisition. So job rec is required uh, as the first step, or you enable it, but you don't require it. So that means if you, you could create a position, but based on certain rules or business decisions, you can create a job requisition, or you can select none of the above. But if you're using recruiting, recruiting, you should have one of these selected. I mean, obviously you could get away with not having it selected, but um, I think it's meant to have at least one of these selected. For job, yeah. for job requisitions, it does need a position, right? In position management. Correct. And we have this other choice here. Def, uh, no, this one, enable job requisition for uh, job management. So if they're using job management, staffing model, then this should be selected. And if you want to enable primary and secondary question, near removal or replacement on evergreen and job requisitions. Hey, Ramesh, for the above one job requisition one for position management, can they do, um, uh, job without uh, position management, sorry, um, enable job requisitions for position management. Um, when you say none of the above, what happens over there? Okay. 
you could just create a position without having to create a requisition. So first one says you must always have a requisition. This one says you can have it sometimes, but if you select this, uh, neither one of these rules apply. But if you do have the job requisition business process, it's, a, it's an actual BP. It's called a B, uh, BP colon uh, job requisition. Okay. If you have that enabled, then you, even if you don't have these two selected, you can still create a requisition, okay. but you're not forcing that decision for every position. Okay, okay, got it. Right. So, so quite, I'm sorry though, I'm just coming back to that again. So you say enable job requisition, does mean that you don't need to create a job, you don't need to create a position, correct? No. If I select this one, it means you will still have to create the position. Like the position has to be created if you're using position management staffing model. So you cannot, there's no exception. The, uh, you see, there's two types of staffing model, right? There's position management and job management. Job. Yes. So if you're using position management, you don't have a choice. The position has to be created. Uh, but if you select this second one, you're saying that sometimes you could create a job requisition and sometimes you will not. And you could put on some conditional rules that like if the location is in United States, then we want to create a, a requisition. If it's in Canada, then we don't need a requisition. So that's what the second choice would be. So the second and third are pretty much equal, right? None of them or enable job requisitions. Yeah. They have the same. Uh, well, they're not exactly the same. This one is conditional job requisition creation. And this one says you don't have to create it at all. Okay. But you could still create it if you have the, uh, if you have that business process enabled. Okay. So this is kind of tricky. Um, what is the general standard over there? They require job requisitions for all positions, right? Especially in position management. Uh, if it really depends on the company, if they want to tightly control their budget, then they will require a job requisition. Okay. If they don't want to tightly require it, then they should not be using position management. They should be using job management. Right. If they, if they're doing a lot of hiring and you don't. they don't want to spend a lot of time in approving stuff, everything's already approved and you want to do quick, uh, quick hiring, quick decision making, and quick data entry, then you should not use position management, you should use job management. And that means you just create the job and then you can hire directly against that job without having to worry about any of the position data. Okay. okay. What is this uh, evergreen job requisition? Uh, which one? Evergreen job acquisition is there, right? Then yeah, so that's, a, that's a definition. We'll, we'll get to it in a little bit. Okay. I, I have that on my, uh, on this Excel sheet I'll post. So we talked about the job requisition section. We talked about the overriding the staffing. And uh, there's also uh, tenant setup recruiting. So let's go there. So some of the items are under edit tenant setup. Just take a note on the 
previous uh, configuration, like I need, I'm going to try to find out why in this instance um, neither radio button was selected for uh, creating a requisition when using position management. Because ideally, in, when you're using including, you, you should have at least one of those radio buttons selected. So I'm just checking a note on that to look into that. As long as uh, it populates all the values from the position, the, right. those options, radio buttons, are not are probably relevant. Yeah. So I'll look into that because, as far yeah. as I knew, that one of those radio, one of those two choices should be selected. Okay. <coughs> um, so here, enable recruiting job areas. This means uh, when you Think of job area, think of job family. So job family means like you have finance jobs, you have engineering jobs, you have sales jobs. And so if you want to submit a resume based on the job family, uh, instead of a requisition, like you want us, you want to say, Hey, this is a resume for any job in the sales area. So then this must be selected. So job areas equal job family. And if you wanna allow people to submit against that job family, then this must be selected. If you don't have this selected, then they have to uh, submit the resume against a requisition or a general submission rather than against a particular job area. So this is a good idea to have it selected based on the company decision. And if you want to enable referrals, uh, this must be selected. Um, I'll get a better definition of what it means by referral ownership level uh, tomorrow. And there was one more item in here. Um, enable automatic candidate merging. So you, it's a good idea to have this selected. That means if you have a candidate who applied like three months ago, they, they applied and you know, they're still in the system as a candidate. Now they applied again, but they used a different email ID, but it's the same person. So the system will detect based on parameters or uh, the, the recruiter will recognize that this is the same person and then they could merge those two profiles eliminating one profile and then you could select which profile data or which data within the profile between those two profiles you want to keep okay and then there is um, uh, interview schedule, calendar integration, so you could integrate with Microsoft Outlook or Google Calendar. And then if you have set aside certain location types, such as cubes uh, for interview scheduling, then they will show up like if you had cubicles. Hey, and sorry, going back, is did this at the referring level what is a referring level instead of just referring referral? Mm -hmm. Referral level. Um, you can look it up later by me. Yeah. I will I'll get you a good definition of that. It basically allows you to 
set up uh, referral relationships. Like uh, the person that you're referring, mm -hmm. is this your family member or is this a friend? Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you want to set that type of relationship. So um, that's flexible for us to create the different types of referral relationships? Yes. Okay. Only if you have that selected. Okay. Yeah. So if you need to enable that here. Got it. And there was something down here. Um, basically the links, if you have your privacy policy or text link, a bunch of other things. Uh, time to fill. This is, you need to tell the system how are you going to, or how does the company, they want to calculate time to fill, like how long did it take to fill this requisition, right? So this does ch change over time. Like uh, time to fill is a metric that shows how quickly a recruiter was able to hire against that rec. So do you want that to be based on the time that the requisition was approved? to the time that it was filled? Or do you want that to be from the time that the requisition was initiated to the time that you found the candidate? So every company will have a different definition. So this gives you the ability to set up uh, how the company wants to define time to fill. Like if you look at the other choices. See, but this opens up the challenge that the, although it, the requisition is approved or completed, it may not be posted out to either internal or external sites, right? Correct. So, you know, uh, do you want to calculate based on when it was approved or do you want to do it based on when it was posted? Not posted yet. Got it. So every company is going to have a different decision. So this is where you could uh, implement that decision or if they want to change their decision, this is where you go to change it. Okay. Where is this even used, time to fill? Uh, uh, this is in the, uh, in the reports. Uh, there's a report that shows how, what was the average time to fill for within that uh, department. Okay, so this is like an audit, it keeps an audit trail of these particular field values. Not an audit trail, but there is a metric that the management wants to know like, hey, how fast are we filling the requisitions? Is it taking 30 days or 90 days? Okay, got it. Okay. Um, the job application stage order. So for that uh, job application DP, it has the different steps. So here, uh, the review stage must be the first one and the ready for hire must be the last one. But within that, you could change the order of the different stages that the candidate will go through. And remove what is not needed also? You could go up and down. We can't remove them, right? Any of them? Yeah. No, we cannot remove them from here. Okay. On the VP itself, under you could put on some conditions that will allow you to skip uh, something. Right, manually you can skip it, but we cannot eliminate it here totally. Correct. So this is the, uh, this is where you modify that uh, order. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff on that screen. And I want to just touch on two more things. So this whole thing in BP would show up just as business application. That's all. Nor it doesn't display all these stages, right? I don't get that question. Now what I'm asking is on the business process side, it doesn't show all these stages, individual stages. It only shows the job applicant or whatever. Uh, they, they will show it. They will show all the, the stages. Okay. Like if you look up BP, you know, job application, okay. you can see the different stages. 
can we skip over there skip them over there itself eliminate them if the client decides not to have any of those stages no no i'm talking about like if you do bp call in and then you look up uh, that business process you will okay. see Just a couple of quick things before we call it a day. Uh, you guys are familiar with constrained roles and unconstrained roles, right? Or yes. some of you guys might be. Yeah. Uh, so in Workday for recruiting, uh, you need to be aware that there is two types of uh, recruiter roles. Uh, the security group. I mean, in simply put, is it like limitation whether you can only do it to your immediate organization, assigned organization, or across the board? Right. So let me look up. Uh, so here's recruiter and then recruiter unconstrained. So if you want your recruiter to have access to only the organization to which the recruiter is assigned, then you will give them, you know, you have this group, uh, but that doesn't make sense, right? Because the candidate might be in an adjacent organization and if you don't have unconstrained group, then the recruiter will not have access to that candidate. So no, work has introduced the, the recruiter candidate. unconstrained role or unconstrained group See, but if he is already applied as a candidate, he, the recruiter will have access through that on his candidate information or page, right? Candidate uh, data. Uh, it depends where the candidate has applied. If the oh. candidate has applied to the requisition that the recruiter owns, or the candidate is in a, like, it might be a sales engineer requisition, mm -hmm. but you might think, oh, this guy's a, great sales engineer, but he's also a great engineer. So uh, a recruiter that's assigned to engineering won't have access to the sales engineer requisitions. So in that case, you want to make sure that you're using the recruiter unconstrained groups as part of your role assignment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. They should have a call. Also. Yeah, they should have Managers a policy. Really have access to their own organization, but if you use manager unconstrained, then they could see outside. They could see the candidates that are outside of their org. Uh, or yeah, maybe they can have one, uh, one or two recruiters internally who would be unconstrained, who would be in that group, who would look after everything in the overall or entire the, across the board, and the rest right. of them will be constrained. Recruiter role. Yep. Uh, so that's how that works. So let me pull up my notes sheet. So everything we talked about is listed here under on my notes. And and the last thing I want to cover today is just uh, this. Familiarize yourself with some of the reports in the system. So there's the find candidates. You could just type in the name of this report in the search bar. Uh, find candidate, candidate pipeline, source effectiveness, find open jobs, refer a candidate, view candidates, compare interview feedback. And tomorrow we'll start the, you know, like what is an evergreen requisition um, how do you create a questionnaire and job recs? So we'll cover that tomorrow. Can you go back to that report screen, please? <coughs> I mean, there's many more reports, but these are the ones that I just uh, came across for right now. All right, so I think let's, uh, let's stop here for today and then let's pick it up tomorrow at 5.30. All right.
thank you guys. Thank you. Bye bye. Ramesh. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh... I think I posed some question on, I'm sorry though, on uh, compensation, but I have not got any answer from you. Um, see if the answer, uh, yeah, there's one about which report to use. Uh, we were, so this is a different topic for everybody else. Uh, Sonia posted a question about uh, which report to use for compensation details and Typically, you know, we may have to build our own report, um, but there is a report that exists in the system um, already. It's called Compensation Details. Compensation Details. There's Worker Compensation Details, and then I made a copy of one. Uh, I put RM Compensation Details. Uh, you put in the supervisory organization's leader. And the reason I ran this report is I wanted to see, I wanted to identify a small group of employees who were on a particular compensation plan so that when I roll out um, the compensation process, I know if it's accurate or not. So this report gives you access to their bonus plan assignment, their compensation grade, and a couple of other items. Uh, their rating and comp ratio and any salary increase. And if you want to see the business object that this report uses, so it's, it's based on the um, all active workers, workers for HCM reporting. And so here it is, it's all on the worker object. And then we have the one-time payment uh, plan as well. So basically when we're looking at this report, what do we need like, uh... So the, the reason I needed this report, right? I wanted to understand like uh, which plan, like I rolled out a particular bonus plan, right? I wanna make sure that the plan has been rolled out to them. So there were multiple ways I could get that data, but um, this is also one way, like I ran this report and let me run it again and I'll show you where the, I wanted to make sure that Everybody in this list had that plan I was looking for. And even if that was not the question, the question would just, you, you have to get to know your population, right? You have, like if you're a sporting work day, you should know all the attributes of uh, the compensation elements. You basically get to know your data like whatever the data is, whether you're working with people data or expense reports, run a report of all the expense reports, what are the different types there are, so you're familiar with the, all the different attributes of whatever you're working on. So here you see uh, what plan these employees are on, so that the plan that we created is also listed here. And then I got to see, hey, <coughs> This is the job family we're using. This is a job profile. So I could, um, I could use this data in, in whatever, you know, I just wanted to know if we we're actually using job families or what kind of, what was the values available for job families in this system. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And the, the, I believe there was a couple of questions. There was one of them, like when we initiate the bonus plan, there is this tab called pro, uh, compensation review option. And I believe when it was done the demo, we selected uh, organ super, supervisory. 
Yes, yes. I and, know. Um, so, um, because bonus plan could be launched against any type of organization, you could launch it on just for a particular cost center, or you could launch it uh, based on a supervisory org. So that step allows you to select which type of organization that you want to roll out the plan to. So on that page, you select uh, supervisory org and then which, uh, you know, who's going to be the top, uh, uh, the top manager to which you're gonna roll out this plan to. Is it the same also when we initiate uh, the merit plan? Because on the merit plan, we have we don't have that uh, we don't have that option, right? I think on the merit plan we have configuration review option. Is it kind of the same? It's the same it's thing. Same. Like merit plan, you know, you it only makes uh, you roll it out to a supervisory org. So. Um, but it, it is a similar, but that screen is only shows up if you're only doing, if you're doing bonus, then uh, that screen shows up where you select which type of org you're going to select. And then make sure you download the, I believe it's like a 25 or 27 page uh, PDF as well on the, on the notes on, on, on advanced content. Hey, Ramesh, can merit plan be initiated from other areas too, like um, talent and performance, right? Uh, so that question is not like a logical question, right? Like you're saying, can can you launch merit from? Uh, talent. Say someone said that they could launch. They're launching it from talent. So is that really? Are they integrated so much like that that they can initiate it from there or? Uh, well, you have to do, you have to launch it either from the plan or you have to launch it from the search bar. Oh, okay. So or from the, the, when you launch from the search bar, it would be for anything, yes. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a specific area. The other area, uh, I mean, there's another way to do this is you pull up a particular org and I believe you could launch it directly for that org. Uh, Never really done it in real life, but I believe there's an option that you, like say I'm gonna pull up this org. Okay. And, and the related actions, from the org's related actions, you should be able to. Yeah, directly from the related actions, there is a. So one other question, a follow-up question. Once you complete all these um, uh, reviews and uh, merit plan reviews and all that, is that data, sent, you have to create, separately create in, um, EAB to send it out to payroll or finance, right? It's not automatically. Correct. Um, yeah, we did talk about that. Like once it's done, you need to, you need to get that data to payroll one way or another. Like if it's within Workday, then they will get it automatically. If, you know, but if it's uh, ADP and you're not integrated with them. Uh, so it, if it is within Workday, like we did the other day, the composition review and everything. If it's within workday, will the payroll and uh, payroll will payroll get it automatically? Correct. Okay. If, if they're using workday payroll, then there's functionality on the workday payroll side to pull up all of the um, the merit process or the focal process data. Oh, okay. Because uh, the data actually goes into the one-time payment plans oh. and you have to pay the one-time payment plans from the, the payroll. Ramesh, I got two more questions. Should should I leave it for tomorrow or? Um, no, let's just finish it. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, one more question. I know there was one section, there's one area where we talk about the, the budget, right? So, you know, we want to make sure that the, with the budget basically kind of align with the organization on HR. So, like, I'm not sure first what number we're looking and at what stage do we have to reach out to, let's say, the compensation admin in order to audit the, the budget. Also on that, let's say if we go, let's say if they go over the budget, if they decide to increase, you know, 
certain people based on the, you know, they decide to increase, you know, certain percentage and they go over budget. Is this something we have to worry about or is this something we have to kind of reduce or? Yeah, so you definitely have to worry about that because that is a configuration that you're going to allow uh, managers to go over budget or you're not going to allow them to go over budget. So if you select that you're not going to allow them to go over budget and then if they need to go over budget even by a dollar, then they cannot proceed, right? The system will give them an error like you have to reduce your budget. Uh, so my suggestion would be, and this is what I have done is within the system, I have always pushed the management. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the management decision, but I always push them to say, do allow them to go over budget because you always have some kind of exception case and you allow the system to allow them to go over budget. But during your training, you know, your offline training to the, to the users or the managers, you enforce, you tell them that, you know, you cannot go over budget. And um, that way you could accommodate any exception cases. So there is a setting at the time of launch where that choice is. And then your first question about when do we audit or at what point do we audit? So once we initiate the merit process, uh, at the last step, it will tell you what the total budget is. And not only it tells you the total budget, it tells you the budget for all of the top level orgs. And then um, you want to get a sign off that this is the true budget and the comp admin will manually calculate what that budget should be. And then you can match it up with the budget that you see within Workday. And that way you could tell if um, maybe there were some prorationing, uh, proration rules that are not set up yet in Workday. Maybe in the manual calculation, they are excluding uh, any particular time that the person was on medical leave, but leave is not set up as a proration within Workday. So it will help you discover those kind of uh, discrepancies. But that will, that should actually, you should do that, like at least at the minimum, like, we, like 10 days before you actually have to launch in real life, because you will find some discrepancy, you will have to fix it, and then you have to audit again. So you definitely need some few days to uh, do that testing. No problem. Thank you. And the hey, last. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, Ramesh, one quick question, last question. I know you gave us that uh, compensation review process intake form, which is kind of the questionnaire that you would um, ask the business or kind of gather requirements. Is there something specifically for uh, merit, or this is all primarily what? is part of the advanced call. Uh, so th that questionnaire covers all uh, three or four scenarios, right? Like those questions apply to uh, merit, bonus, etc. So that's for all, all of the scenarios. Okay, so if we get, kind of get familiar with all those questions, yes. what you mean, uh, that should give us a better yep. like the requirement gathering. Okay, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the last question, like you say that there's a report to download the data, compensation grid data, and that 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 report is this some like <coughs> who, has, who, has to, who has to complete that data and where the information is basically where do we where do where do we get the data if we have to complete that data where do we get the data to complete that report so um, I was referring to downloading the data that's in the grid so as the you know the, the uh, when you launch the conversation process to the managers managers mm -hmm. see that grid right with like employee name this is their target budget, this is their current salary, this is what's proposed new salary. 
So I was referring that um, some companies would like to do analysis on that data before you close that process. So in that case, you need a report like, uh, you need to be able to download that, um, that data, whatever's in that grid, you need to be able to download that. And that is a custom report. Um, if I did not share how the screenshots of that, I'll, I'll take some screenshots right now and, and just post them. So you know like what, which business object to select. That would be great. Okay. So I will do some screenshots right now, actually. Hey, um, Ramesh, are you planning to do those uh, uh, activity guide kind of thing for benefits and recruitment also? For uh, benefits and recruitment, is that what you said? Yes. Uh, well, for benefits, I think that Excel grid, uh, it has the, the screenshots and then uh, now planning on doing that for benefits, like every task that you need to do, for example, I think is, I have it on a separate tab. Okay. And the tabs actually indicate the order of those activities. So starting from the left is what you have to do first and then, you know, to the right. And then there's, uh, so there's two, two or three Excel sheets. And I think it's, uh, yeah, there are two Excel sheets if I remember. Um, one yes. is primarily for the setup and the other one is for the benefit plans, I guess, and enrollments. Correct. So, um, I basically took a screenshot of, you know, what those, uh, UIs look like and what the sample data should be. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Probably, um, if we can review in the class one time to give us an idea, that'd be helpful going forward for us to, okay. Class is finished. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Safe. Okay. So we'll see Ramesh, Ram Ramesh, please, Ramesh, please don't forget the the I nine. If you have any information on that, like the you know how to implement this, that will be nice. Okay. I will. Uh, you know, we'll talk about that when we. I, I made a note of that, so we'll make sure we cover it when we do the onboarding. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'm gonna stay online because I wanna take screenshots of the. Uh, the bonus grid report. Okay. Uh, but you guys could drop off now if you want. Now I'm going to stay in so I can see that. You know, this, the recruiting, this will definitely help me because, you know, I, I think I'm like on the middle stage. I, I'm, I'm apply, I apply for, uh, I'm like in a, like the second stage of the interview for an HR. Because right now I'm an HR, but uh, like only the function, like the functional side, like just the job change promotion, you know, this is why I'm taking, I'm taking like the technical side. So I'm like in a process of interview right now, and uh, and uh, and the the company said that they're planning to roll the recruiting module. You know. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and I have a, you know I have all I have a good feelings like ninety five percent that you know that it will like the the, the job will go well like you know. It will go well for me. Okay. So this is a custom report, uh, the data source here. So that's mean that we have to go and create a custom report, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, 
this is the columns, and then let me also put in the filters. I'm sorry, what was the business object worker, correct? Uh, you could, you'll be able to see the business object from here. Uh, I'm sharing it, right? Just, yeah. yeah, so the business object is adjustment for? Yeah, yeah. Okay, adjustment for and uh, the uh, data source is all compensation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you for attending the session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Also feel free to ask your questions in the comment section below, and we will reply to them at the earliest.